Um, today is a really special day for me. It's um, exactly three years ago today, to this date, uh, I reached Antigua. I was, I was on the shores of Antigua. I, I reached Antigua tired, I was wet, um, I, was, um, I had a lack of sleep, and it was the best feeling ever. I spent uh, 106 days at sea and uh, rowing from Spain all the way across the Atlantic to Antigua. And this is, I think, this was probably the most uh, important thing I've done in my life. It's one of the big milestones in my life. And that was the route I took. And that's what my great teacher had to say. That's my fourth grade report. And I'm not sure if you can read that, but it says here, gives up easily. <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, uh, this is what she had to say about me at that time. And since then, I've been sort of thinking what really, uh, what makes people give up? What makes pe some people give up? And some people continue and achieve their goals, right? And I've been thinking a lot about that since I did this three years ago. And um, sort of 106 days is a long time to, uh, to reflect. And uh, I realized that it's something called self-knowing, right? Which, by definition, is knowing oneself, his or own character. I mean, how many of us do we really know ourselves, right? So this got me thinking, and then what is knowing yourself, and what's faith, and what's a belief, right? What's the difference? Faith is unproven, so you can have faith in something, but you don't need to have proof. Right? You can have faith in God. You can have faith in the, in the designers of the Titanic, but you don't need proof. That's faith. Belief is a concept, really. Um, it's a concept that, it's an opinion. So you might believe that the Titanic is unsinkable. Somebody else might believe it's sinkable, right? But it's still just a concept. It's up to discussion. But knowing, self-knowing, is really something uh, you know. It can't be argued. And that's something with proof. So what I'm going to do today is I'd like to talk about something that I discovered, something uh, through my thoughts, my experience, I discovered something called self-knowing. I'm going to tell three short stories about it. The first one was Himalayas, right? I suffer from something called acrophobia, which um, I've sort of overcome now, but it's an extreme irrational fear of heights, right? I'm terrified of heights. And in some cases, this can be life-threatening as well. In, uh, in 2003, this is, this is a village in Ladakh. It's on the border of India and China. And I decided to, to try and climb a mountain. Anybody watching me climb a mountain, I climbed up to 5,000 meters, right? And anybody watching me climb that would have thought it was like a drunk Spider-Man, you know, trying to, trying to lick the, the ice off the, off the mountainside. I was stuck to the floor. Right? And what they tell you in movies is don't look down. If you're, if you're afraid of heights, that's great. But how do you get back down without looking down? Right? That's what they don't teach you. So I was terrified. Going up was OK for me. But going down was terrified. So here I was alone, and I spent a whole day. This is 5,000 meters, 15,000 feet. Right? Um, I spent a whole day stuck there on the mountain. And I was cold, and I didn't have any food. And this was taken by uh, another, this picture was taken by another group of people who were with me, passing and trekking. And they were like, do you need some help going down? And I was like, it's, it's all right, man, I'll, I'll get down by myself, you know? So I spent about a day trying to just try my, trying to figure out how to get down off the mountain. And what I realized was this was really <coughs> rational fear, right? I didn't have, there wasn't any logic to my fear. It was high, and I should have started maybe from Muzubaki and then Shista before going to, you know, 5,000 meters, but too late for that. So this was, um, this taught me a lot about fear. I remember something a teacher told me once. Uh, I was in grade school, I was in detention, and it was by the eighth time, I think, I was in detention, right? And I was so afraid of losing, um, uh, uh, you know, so afraid of um, uh, getting suspended from school. And she said, if you're looking for sympathy, you're going to find that in the dictionary, right? <laughs> so that's what she said. I felt so sorry for myself. And I sort of tried to talk my way out of it. You know? So I ended up talking my way down. 
right? And uh, that was one of the greatest things she told me. Uh, so this was, what I learned from this was my psychology of dealing with fear. I dealt with fear through, through more uh, talking myself out of fear. The next, sorry, the next one was Siberia, right? In 2004, uh, I went to Siberia alone, right? It wasn't planned. I, I went in the winter, and this was because no, I couldn't find anybody to come with me, right? So I found myself alone in Siberia, and I had no idea uh, how I'd, I'd feel about it. But what I knew was I did want to really experience Siberia in the winter, right? So that's me. And I spent, uh, I spent um, about a month in Lake Baikal, and I trekked all alone down to, uh, to, uh, to Mongolia, and it was fantastic, right? It was cold, it was minus 50. Siberia, Lake Baikal was minus 30 at that time. Uh, I hadn't, uh, I wasn't dressed properly. It was nothing, I wasn't prepared at all, but it was beautiful, spectacular. And what I learned from that, uh, down in Mongolia, I, um, I stayed with the nomads. This was out in the tent in minus 50. It was just fantastic. And I think going to Siberia alone was one of the best things I did because it taught me a lot about my own self in terms of how I dealt with, uh, with being lonely, right? Just keeping myself entertained and also being physically, uh, physically, uh, what do you call it, um, uncomfortable, right? I could put up with the unease, the cold. I could put up with the bad equipment. That was great. Good to know that. So that I stayed out with them for about a week in Siberia. So I could deal. I knew how I dealt with isolation. I knew how I dealt with uh, with the physical discomfort. In the Atlantic, that's 2005. That's the Atlantic Ocean, right? It's the second largest ocean in the world, right? Quick facts. 76 square kilometers. It's about 6.5 times the size of the United States, right? And for those who can't picture that, it's about three times the size of that IKEA at Kungskurva, right? <laughs> Let's put that in perspective. And this was what I fell in love with. I fell in love with the idea of trying to go across the Atlantic in a small boat. So how do you prepare? How do you start? How, do you, how will it all end, right? This was very much, I had no idea. There's no school I could go to. There was no books you could read. There's no qualification you could have. Uh, but I did like the idea. And so it was me and this idea, right? And then we had the people around me, right? And it was amazing how, how society is never short of telling you not to do something. Even my best friends, even my, your cousins, everybody. Oh, it's a stupid idea. Oh, it's crazy. It's never going to work. You're going to die. You're going to eat by sharks. All of that. So you, you start off with this doubt because there's nothing I knew about. I, I had this doubt about the idea, right? Would it be a good idea? Is this something good to do? Is this a good challenge? Um, the financial pressure was huge. It, it was about, it takes, it's about 100,000 euros to do this, right? So I spent 100,000 euros of my own money. And I put the money down. So I was going to go for broke, right? In April 2006, I went down to Tenerife um, and then La Gomera. This was my first attempt. And that's the boat. That's my start. My first attempt was a total disaster. I was caught in a storm. I was late. April was into the hurricane season. I was... I, I had so much pressure on me because I had these people on one end saying, don't do this, this is stupid, you're going to die, you'll never make it, right? More than that, they were just, they didn't think at all I could make it, right? Uh, you, you haven't tried it, you're not physically fit enough, you know, uh, all sorts of stuff, right? And they were laughing about it, they were having taken bets between themselves if I'm going to make it. So, but this was bad because I also had the press pressure. We had a PR agency and uh, I had sponsors at that time. Uh, so they had sent out press releases, right? So you had the media pressure as well. And something that I didn't have before. Media pressure was very new to me at this time. And I left nevertheless. I was stuck at sea for five days in a storm. And I was pushed back to land. My second attempt. I, I got arrested, right? <laughs> Not my fault, OK? This was OK. I was devastated for the first attempt, right? But the second attempt, I got arrested. And what's worse than getting arrested is my mother found out, 
what I was doing, right? So she found out. Uh, she saw it on the news, right? Ah, that was terrible because, like, it's okay when friends tell you you can't do something. And I started surrounding myself with, you know, with people who just said yes all the time, right? And when your mother says something, yeah, maybe you listen, you know. And she was so pissed off. But I, I sort of disconnected from the whole family thing. But this was my second attempt. So that was um, the, the second one. The third one was the 15th of Jan. Right? And this was my third attempt from the island. And this is a map of the island, actually. And that's La Gomera. <laughs> and basically, you can see how hard it is to leave. These, this is my map and how I sort of uh, got caught in the currents and moved around. It was extremely hard to leave from the island. You know, there's so many underwater currents and so many tides. And I, I was devastated. I had to be rescued at 12 in the morning. Right? I called a friend. And I had to get a tow back in. And and this time, I really started doubting myself. The first time was a storm. OK, you know, maybe it's a bad idea. Can I really do this? Second time wasn't my fault. But third time, I had everything organized. I spent the whole Christmas doing all the paperwork, and I tried to leave. And uh, uh, it, was, it was devastating. It was really, this was being publicly humiliated, humiliated is, uh, is, is a, pretty, a pretty tough thing to take, right? The press release had gone out again. And at this point, actually, after I failed the third time, nobody believed I could leave. I was a joke on the island because people had seen me leave so many times. So they'd be keep saying, Bhavik, when are you leaving? When are you leaving? Right? <laughs> and I was I'm going on Thursday. Like, OK, yeah, why don't you come for dinner on Saturday? Ha, ha, ha. So because I, I'd been on the island now a year just trying to leave, you know? Just trying to leave a year. This is the fourth attempt. So I said, all right, I'm going to no more this island. Let me take it to the last island. So I left. Finally, on the fourth, right? On the fourth, I left from El Hierro. And five days later, this is what happened. I broke my rudder. That's my rudder lying on the deck of the boat. And by any standards, I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, um, a carpenter or a mechanic, right? And the most I know about making something is with Lego when I was in fourth grade. And that my teacher said I give up easily. So this is my rudder. And the best piece of advice I got, I think, was I was, I was by the marina in, um, uh, in La Gomera getting ready for my, for my row. And I was putting together the toolbox, you know, for I had no idea what tools there were, just a screw and a hammer and all these kind of stuff, right? And uh, th there's an old English sailor there. And we sort of became friends. And he said, you know, he was shaking his head. I was like, what? Well, what's, uh, what's wrong? He's like, you only need two things at sea. One is oil, and the other one is rope, right? If it moves, and it's not supposed to move, right? Sorry, if it's supposed to move, and it doesn't, use the oil, right? And if it doesn't move, and it's supposed to move, use the rope. So that was the best advice I got. And that's how I fixed my rudder, right? I tied that up, and I could sort of live with that. Uh, it was a really makeshift thing. Yeah, but what I didn't realize was that the, that, uh, that the rudder had, had a leak, uh, had made a hole at the back of the boat. So basically, uh, in another seven days, I discovered a foot of water in the boat. So that was the other problem. And this was the lowest point of my entire expedition. I, start, I lost faith in the idea. I lost faith. I was at the position where should I call for rescue? Because now I'm 300 miles away, too late, just about the right time for rescue. Any more than that, I'd be away. You know, out of hell rescue uh, reach, right? So this was, this was a big decision to take. And uh, I decided to try and fix it myself. And you know, we're just taking everything out. This is the deck of my boat and all this equipment's outside the, uh, outside the cabin. I had to bail water out. It was constant stress. It, was, it, was, it wasn't fun. Life at sea sucked, to be honest. It really sucked. This is, uh, this is a boat and I, 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 had, you know, I had to keep awake just to make sure I didn't get run over by all these cruise ships because they couldn't see me in the water. That's a, that's a, big, uh, that's a big ship just missing me by a meter. Uh, not by a meter, by, by about half a kilometer. And then finally, when I didn't think it get, could get worse, I capsized, right? I capsized. I think everything that went wrong went wrong. And I finally capsized about 300 miles away from Antigua. I lost everything that I had. I lost my, uh, you know, well, clothes was OK, but I lost everything on the deck, I lost my food, and uh, I lost it all. But 
this is something. I kept doubting myself to this point. I always doubted my idea. And everything that happened, I started losing faith in my idea, my faith in why should I, am I doing the right thing with this. And this is what I realized, right? Out at sea, this is what people, all my critics, everybody who said it's not possible, this is what they didn't know, this is what they never, uh, never realized. That's, that's one of the many sunsets I saw out at sea. That's an awesome leatherback turtle. I had this, this was my morning view. I had this ringside seat that there's a whales, right? And I had this almost every day. I had, even the storms are great. You see these huge storms come by the horizon. That'd be fantastic, right? And this is what they never experienced and will probably never experience, right, in their lives. And this picture, there's one picture. If they had 10 points so far and I had zero, I think that one picture was worth a million points, right? That is a flying fish. That's a dorada that's jumping out, and it's eating a flying fish right in front of my boat. It's just the most beautiful view ever. And I had this, this is, I was lucky to take this picture because this day goes so fast. But being here, being in that moment, and being in this position where you, you have this ringside seat, right? This is something that they would never experience, ever. And, and I finally reached Antigua. And that's me hitting land. Anyway, the reason for me telling you this is what I realized is getting back to the question of knowing, right? The, the, the Himalayas taught me how to get over my fear, right? I learned that. That was my small solo lesson from that. The Siberia taught me how to deal with, uh, uh, to, to deal with really the, the, um, the, the weather, the elements, the, the physical discomfort, to be alone. I had no problem with that. But what I never learned to deal with was really trust my, uh, my, my faith and in my, in my judgment, my decision to do this, really trust my decisions. And that's what I realized is that the difference between giving up and really doing something is winning these small battles where we have faith in ourselves and we know, we don't have faith, we don't have belief, but we know with proof that we can do something. So I, I believe this was the best idea, I, best thing that I did. And uh, what's different now is that the person who, who left Spain and the person who arrived weren't the same person, right? Uh, when I left Spain, I had no faith in my ideas. When I arrived, uh, I started really believing in my decisions. And it, in December this year, I'm, I'm gonna leave to sail around the world single-handed. And what I've learned from the Atlantic, uh, from the Himalayas, and uh, from Siberia, all come together to help me do that. Um, and what I've realized is not once since I've made that decision, right, have I really asked anybody, am I doing the right thing, right? I have no doubt in my mind at all. So that's what's changed for me. And I think if I had to leave a message, I'd say this, right? We can only truly know ourselves through the challenges we face and, and how we react to them, right? What, what our response is and how we deal with it, right? And the fact that how well you know yourself is really going to change the way you deal with life, right? So think about your solar challenge, and I hope you find it. Thanks.